Hello, welcome to the seventh year of the Nutritionist webinar series. I'm Marianne Fezenden, Educational and Academic Liaison for AMTS and your host for this series. This year, we are focusing solely on emissions with an emphasis on dairy cattle and what we as nutritionists need to focus on to keep our industry viable, sustainable, and profitable whilst minimizing the effect dairy has on the environment. To that effort, our speakers this year will focus on providing information and help us get accurate information spread beyond the industry. Typically, I play music prior to the start of each webinar session. This year, we've decided to hold an open question forum 30 minutes prior to the start of each presentation. This is an opportunity to ask team members questions on any topic, be it program functionality, model biology, or specific nutrition management questions. The Zoom webinar will be live on Facebook and retention of those conversations will be able to be found on our Facebook page. Today we are joined by Dr. Frank Mitlerner. Frank received his master's degree in animal science from the University of Leipzig in Germany and his PhD in animal science from Texas Technical University. He started his academic career at the University of California, Davis, where he is professor in animal science and air quality specialist. Dr. Mitlerner is frequently sought after for his expertise and ability to bring stakeholders together to address issues regarding air quality and agricultural efficiencies and sustainability. His work in this regard has included serving as chairman of a global United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization partnership project to benchmark the environmental footprint of livestock production. He was a work group member on President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology and a member of the National Academy of Science Institute of Medicine Committee on a Framework for Assessing the Health, Environmental, and Social Effects of the Food System. You can find him on Twitter at GHGGuru. We are honored to have him join us this month. His topic is Rethinking Methane and the Path to Climate Neutrality. I will now start the recorded presentation. Frank will be joining us for questions after the presentation. Please put your questions in the chat window. Hi, my name is Frank Mitlöner and uh, I'm here in the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis and I want to talk about livestock and climate uh, to you today. If you are on social media, I'm as well uh, on Twitter, GHG Guru, come and join me. So the topic of Greenhouse gases and how they affect climate is sometimes not well understood by many audiences. And so allow me a few words just on that. What you see on this slide here is the sun radiating down solar beams to the surface of the earth. Normally that solar radiation and the associated heat would be reflected back into space if there weren't a blanket of greenhouse gases. And greenhouse gases are gases such as methane, CO2, nitrous oxide and others. And as you can see on this slide, this blanket pretty much retains the solar radiation in our atmosphere, at least a large part of it. And that means solar radiation and solar heat is retained and heats up the planet. And without greenhouse gases, life on this planet would be way too cold. So we need that effect, the so-called greenhouse effect. The problem is we have too many greenhouse gases. It means the blanket is getting too thick and that means too much heat is retained. The question now is, how much do different sectors of society contribute to this greenhouse effect? And in particular for animal agriculture, how much methane? Because methane is the Achilles heel of animal agriculture. This slide here shows what's called the global warming potential of various greenhouse gases. GWP100 is the abbreviation and it shows how methane and nitrous oxide compare with respect to the potency to trap heat versus CO2. And so if, let's say, a source produces 10 tons of methane, all you need to do is multiply the 10 tons of methane that the source emits times this GWP100 factor of 28. So 10 times 28 is 280 tons of CO2 equivalent or CO2e. 
That's how that works. Same true, the same is true for nitrous oxide. If you have a certain amount of nitrous oxide that's emitted, you multiply that times 265 and then you achieve CO2 equivalent emissions. The problem is that this matrix, that's what it's called, GWP100, which by the way was first invented in 1990, so 30 years ago, leaves out some very important nuances around methane and I want to uh, really bring some clarity to that. What you see on this slide is the global methane budget. You see here that on the left side of the slide are numerous sources of methane, including fossil fuel use, agriculture and waste, biomass burning, wetlands and others. And as you can see, when you look at this left half bubble on the left, um, you see that the sources amount to a total of approximately 560 teragrams of methane that are emitted globally. So 560 teragrams are emitted, but if you look closely on the right side of the slide, you see that there are also significant sinks. And these sinks amount to a total of 550 teragrams. 560 are produced, but 550 are destroyed. And that means the balance between the two is 10. Still a number that we seek to further reduce, but certainly one that's very different from just looking at the emissions alone. So when we hear about this sink or the destruction of methane, what is it? What takes place there? Well, what takes place is a so-called atmospheric removal process. There are molecules in the air that sooner or later get in contact with methane. And these molecules are called radicals. To be precise, they're called hydroxyl radicals. And when these hydroxyl radicals meet a methane molecule, they destroy it. And that happens within 10 years, approximately 10 years. And that means that methane is not just produced, but also destroyed and destroyed atmospherically by these radicals. This process is not really considered when doing the calculations with this GWP100 unit that I talked about on my previous slide. But should it be considered? In my opinion, it should. Because if a significant greenhouse gases is not just produced but also destroyed, then that makes a huge difference with respect to the accounting process. If you look at this large arrow pointing down on the sink side here, you see underneath it says sink from chemical reactions in the atmosphere. And again, remember, that is this atmospheric removal it's called hydroxyl oxidation. Why does it matter so much? It matters because this destruction of this greenhouse gas does not occur with other greenhouse gases. It only occurs with methane. And that leads methane to be a short-lived greenhouse gas. It's called a short-lived climate pollutant. I call methane the fast and furious. Furious because it has a good punch to it. But fast because it's short-lived. And believe me, Knowing about the, the short-lived nature of it makes all the difference in the world. As you can see on this slide here, methane has a lifespan of 10 to 12 years, but CO2 has one of a thousand years. Okay? So CO2 is less potent, but it has a much longer lifespan. I will now walk you through where the carbon in the methane, the CH4 carbon, where that carbon comes from, where it originates. It all starts with photosynthesis or the process by which plants take carbon out of the air and then they take that carbon in the form of CO2 from the atmosphere and make it into carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, carbohydrates such as cellulose or starch. Those carbohydrates are then ingested by a bovine, a cow let's say, and uh, in the rumen methanogens, methane forming microbes do their little work and produce this gas, methane, CH4. But is the carbon in this methane, in the CH4, is that carbon new and additional to our atmosphere? And the answer to that question is no. It's recycled carbon. It was in the atmosphere before in the form of CO2. So this methane here from constant sources, let's say constant cattle herds, will be produced but also destroyed almost at equal rates. 
Most scientists will agree today, particularly in the climate arena, that a constant source of methane, and that's important, a constant source of methane, will produce methane, but also an equal amount will be destroyed. So a constant source of methane is almost climate neutral. Okay? If you increase methane, then you produce more methane than is being destroyed, and that adds new additional methane, new additional warming. But if you manage to reduce methane through smart mitigation, then you can pull carbon out of the air. And that induces negative warming. A negative warming is a fancy word for cooling. So after about 10 years, this methane that's now in the air, belched out by cattle or coming from the manure, will meet these radicals, these hydroxyl radicals, and that destroys methane and converts it back to where it came from, CO2. But this CO2 is not new and additional, it is recycled, it was in the atmosphere before. So the so-called biogenic carbon cycle around cattle is very different from other sources of greenhouse gases, such as the fossil fuel sector. And I will show you how and why. But remember, the biogenic carbon cycle is one that is relatively short-lived in nature and goes around and around and around. And it has been for a long, long time. So now let's look at another source of greenhouse gases, the use of fossil fuel. So first of all, what are fossil fuels? Fossil fuels are oil, coal, gas, um, and they originally were plant material or animal material, you know, animals such as dinosaurs, that populated our planet a long time ago, hundreds of millions of years ago. All that biomass that lived on Earth before then died, decayed, fossilized, accumulated underground, and over the last 70 years, 70 that is, humans extracted approximately half of all that carbon, half of that ancient carbon. We took it out of the ground, we brought it to the surface, we burned it with cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships, and now that carbon is in the atmosphere. Every time we extract new carbon from the ground and we burn it, we add new additional carbon to the atmosphere. And this is why the biogenic carbon cycle that I showed you on the previous slide versus fossil carbon are quite different. On this slide here you see them contrasted. On the left side, the fossil fuel carbon. On the right side, the biogenic carbon. Again, a one-way street on the left side, and on the right side you see a cyclical situation where atmospheric CO2 makes it by photosynthesis into first above ground vegetation, then those plants take the carbon that came out of the air or from the air and they put it into the ground, into the roots, and from there the carbon gets stored in the soil. A process called soil carbon sequestration. It is be believed that our soils trap and capture one-third of all human produced carbon. So healthy soils are a very important component in our fight against climate change. Proper ranching, proper uh, livestock handling can intensify soil carbon sequestration because by adding manure to the soil we enhance soil microbial activity and therefore we enhance soil carbon sequestration. What's also important here to see uh, is that when the animals eat the buff ground vegetation, yes, they belch out manure, uh, they belch out methane, they, all, they, they also of course produce manure, and both sources, enteric emissions and manure, produce methane, but that is destroyed and put back into CO2. So colleagues of mine from Oxford University in the UK years ago decided that they needed to blow the whistle uh, because the way that we quantify methane does not really take into consideration the fact that methane is a short-lived climate pollutant, that methane um, is not just produced but also destroyed. They said the old unit GWP100 critically mischaracterizes the impact of that gas on warming and they proposed a new unit, a new matrix called GWP star. But before I get to GWP star, um, GWP100 overestimates, overestimates the impact of constant sources of methane on warming by a factor of four. As colleagues from Oxford have said it for years, I have said it for years, 
and most recently that was publicly acknowledged by the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. This new, this new unit that Oxford uh, came up with, GWP star, is actually a unit or a matrix that takes the short-lived nature of methane into consideration and it actually looks at the atmospheric removal of methane. And that's very important. I just told you that the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, acknowledged that the old unit GWP100 mischaracterizes the impact of constant sources on methane. And if you want to read that up, please go to the IPCC AR6 report. In uh, chapter 7 you will find on page 123 this excerpt that I uh, put out here, which says that there's a drastic overestimation from constant sources uh, that is the result of using this old unit GWP100. Um, I will show you in the next couple of slides why that really matters, okay? Because the world has been characterizing the impact of, of livestock methane on climate in a way that is significantly flawed and that needs to be rectified. In order to understand that, you need to understand the difference between various greenhouse gases, one being CO2, the other one being methane. I'll start with CO2. Let's imagine that you were to live about 20 miles or kilometers away from home, sorry, that you work 20 kilometers from home and uh, that you have to drive to work. On Monday you drive, let's say uh, that's day one, and when you burn gas then you put CO2 into the air. On Tuesday you drive the same distance and you put new additional carbon into the air, which is now in addition to what you put out the previous day. On Wednesday you drive again and you add new additional carbon to the existing stock from Monday and Tuesday and to what you put into the air last week, last month, last year, last decade, to what your parents and grandparents put into the air. CO2 is a stock gas. Every time we burn fossil fuel we add new and additional carbon to the existing stock. It is less potent than methane but it stays in the atmosphere pretty much forever. Currently, methane is treated by most public policymakers as if it were to behave the same way as CO2. As if methane every time is belched out or produced from animal manure, as if every time that were to happen we were to add new and additional methane to the atmosphere. It leaves out the fact that there is an atmospheric removal of methane. Is that a problem? Yes, it is a problem. What you see here is a depiction of how methane uh, accumulates or not accumulates in the atmosphere. If, let's say, you have a constant source of methane, let's say a constant dairy herd or a constant beef herd, then the amount of methane produced and the amount of methane destroyed over, let's say, 20 years are roughly in balance. That makes methane a flow gas. Okay? Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying methane doesn't matter. Methane does matter. I told you it's the fast and furious. But if we have constant sources of methane, then these constant sources do not add additional carbon to the atmosphere and hence not additional warming to our climate. And if we reduce methane, if we manage to mitigate it, then we can pull carbon out of the air. And that is a real opportunity to us. I will now show you how the old unit GWP100 versus the new GWP star compare. And I do so by, by showing you three scenarios. The first one is one where over 30 years we increase the amount of methane by 35%. The second scenario is one where methane is kept pretty stable. Maybe we slightly reduce it by 10%. And the third scenario is one where we reduce methane by a lot, 35%. How would the old unit GWP100 characterize these three scenarios? It would predict that in all three cases we were to add a lot of additional CO2 equivalent emissions to our atmosphere. And that we know cannot be true because if we have constant or decreasing sources of methane, then there can't be additional CO2 equivalent emissions. So let's see what this new unit from Oxford GWP star predicts for the three same scenarios. Three w, uh, GWP star predicts that if you increase methane by a lot, 
you add a lot of additional warming. And that's what you see here as being blue north of the x-axis. In fact, when we increase methane, then GWP star and GWP100 align. We do not want to add increasing amounts of methane to our atmosphere. But look what happens in the second scenario. If we hold our methane stable or slightly reduce it, then you will not see any blue north of the x-axis and that means no additional warming. In fact, because this scenario says reduce by 10% over 30 years, which is a slight reduction, we see a little bit of blue south of the x-axis and that means there's now a little bit of negative warming. But look what happens in the third scenario. If we reduce methane by a lot over 30 years, by 35%, then we are pulling a lot of carbon from the air. And that means we are now generating significant cooling. Now that's a real opportunity. So the question then will be, can such a strong reduction of methane be achieved? The answer is absolutely yes. Here in California, we have probably the most aggressive uh, regulation on methane anywhere in the world. Um, our farmers are mandated to reduce methane by 40 percent, 4-0. And that reduction has to happen by the year 2030, below 2013 thresholds. The legislature decided to not use the Kane approach of rules and regulations and fines to make farmers reduce methane, but to use the carrot approach of using financial incentives to help farmers reduce methane. And that helped. Over the last few years, many of our farmers, dairy farmers, and we talk about large dairies, uh, decided to cap their lagoons, to cover their lagoons and trap the biogas that's formed underneath. This technology in general is called anaerobic digestion. Okay? And this is how it looks like when it's applied here in California. So they take what's called a lagoon where the manure is stored, they cover it and they trap the biogas 60% of which is methane. And instead of that biogas going into the air, they are now capping it, capturing it, and converting it into a fuel type called renewable natural gas. And this fuel type is then used to fuel vehicle fleets. So up until now, we are reducing about 2 million metric tons of greenhouse gases from manure management here in California. That amounts to almost a 30% reduction of methane uh, from our dairy sector. And that's pretty revolutionary and that's incredible. I've never thought it would be possible that in just a few years, a sector as large as our dairy sector can reduce 30% of its manure based methane. And this is what it looks like. You take the RNG from the dairy, the renewable natural gas that came from animal biogas, bio and you then run it into vehicles such as semi-trucks or buses or other vehicle types. And uh, that conversion of biogas to renewable natural gas is considered the most carbon negative fuel type there is. As a result, it's strongly financially incentivized by the state with a special kind of carbon credit it's called low carbon fuel standard credit, and that makes it financially very worthwhile to producers. In my opinion, in the next few years, we'll have many more dairies jumping onto this, uh, reducing methane, and when doing so, pulling a lot of carbon from the air. When you reduce methane this strongly, then you're pulling so much carbon from the air that that leads to a negative warming effect, i.e. cooling effect, that's offsetting other greenhouse gases that are also produced from these dairies. Overall, if methane reductions are strong enough, then they can lead a dairy to become climate neutral. Because what is pulled out of the air on the methane side offsets other greenhouse gases, leading these operations to a point where they no longer have a warming impact of these operations. So here in the dairy industry in the United States, we have seen some incredible uh, developments over the last few years. We used to have a much larger herd of 25 million dairy cows. Today, we have nine. So we went from 25 to 9 million dairy cows, but with this much smaller herd, we are producing 60% more milk. 
And that has led to a situation where the carbon footprint of a glass of milk in this country has now been reduced by two-thirds. How? Well, there are several main tools. One of them is reproductive efficiency, which has drastically increased over the last few decades. Another one is the veterinary system, which has markedly uh, improved. We are preventing or treating diseases that lead to better health outcomes. We have learned to improve genetic merit of both feed plants and animals. And last not least, the fourth bubble here on this slide is feed management, which has drastically improved. We now really know what to feed our cows to get optimum uh, production. And all of these four tools will not just improve performance of cows, but also the environmental impact of those, of those farms. If you want to um, have a little bit more information, uh, the CLEAR Center that I'm directing has put out several documents. One of them is a white paper. Uh, you see it here on the left. It's uh, showing how U.S. beef and dairy can reach climate neutrality. Um, and uh, please don't be mistaken. This is not just something that applies to the United States. It can apply to any part of the world. Uh, it contains not just uh, the recipe as to how you can calculate and what it means uh, to achieve reductions with respect to, uh, to climate, but also uh, it contains uh, Excel spreadsheets that help you do calculations for wherever you are in the world. So that's the left one, the white paper. The right one here is a YouTube video our center has put together called Rethinking Methane. It summarizes in five minutes uh, what we have learned over the last few years about methane and why that really matters to you. I strongly recommend that you download and watch and share uh, that important YouTube video. So one of the questions I get frequently is, can we eat our way out of climate change? There are people who are very much set to change what we eat because they, are, um, they believe that our food choices have a drastic impact on climate. So, can we change uh, climate by changing our food? Some colleagues of mine looked into what it would take for an omnivore to go vegan with respect to carbon savings. And they found that if you were to decide to go vegan for one year, you would reduce your carbon footprint by 0.8 tons of CO2 equivalent emissions. 0.8 tons. Now you might ask, is that a lot or not? So let's Contrast that to another activity, a uh, transatlantic flight from the United States to Europe per passenger generates 1.6 tons of greenhouse gases. So in other words, it would take you two years to be vegan to offset one single transatlantic flight per passenger. So now you decide whether that's a lot or not. Uh, an entire country like the United States going meatless Monday, meaning no animal source foods on one day a week, would reduce the carbon footprint of the United States by 0.3%. And the entire United States going vegan, no more animal source foods whatsoever, which is propagated by some part of the media, um, if the entire country were to do that, we would reduce our carbon footprint by 2.6% of the total. So I would argue that um, the whole discussion around food choices and climate is largely a smokescreen, one that points us at a source, but certainly not any of the major sources. So whether you personally uh, eat one diet over the other might have many, many different motivators, but the climate will not be changed in any major way. If you want to know what one of the greatest impacts of our food system is on the environment, it's depicted on this slide. You see here the average US family in front of all the waste, of, in front of all the food that's wasted. 40% of all the food produced in this country, 40% of all the food produced in all developed, and 40% of all the food produced in all developing countries never makes it through a human digestive tract. It is wasted. In the developed world, wasted at the consumer level, in our kitchens or restaurants, and in the developing countries of the third world, 
we speak of food losses rather than food waste because there the majority of food is lost at the farmer level because farmers can't harvest on time, can't transport on time, can't preserve the food on, you know, in, a, in a proper way and so on. 40% food loss, food waste is a number that applies globally. And if you were to be really concerned about the impact of our food system on climate, this would definitely be the number one issue, the largest stone to turn around and, uh, and look under. So with that, I just want to point out that uh, the CLEAR Center, uh, we write a blog and uh, you might find many articles uh, on that site uh, under this address here. And of course, please visit us on our webpage, the CLEAR Center webpage, clear.ucdavis.edu. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I hope that you learned something new. Thank you very much. So now that we've completed the, the presentation part of the, the webinar, thank you, Frank, for joining us today. Dr. Mittler's slides will be available as a PDF document for download from our website. That page has links to the recording and the PDF presentation there, as well as the papers that Frank mentioned in the webinar. I'll put in links to those. I'm also going to link to the CLEAR Center. It is a terrific resource. And I've done a few articles on our blog that I've leaned heavily on um, resources that he has collected there. I do convert the audio of the webinars to podcasts. You can find those under the podcast tab on the webinar or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. We'll get to the questions in a few minutes, but I wanna thank my team and my sponsors. Next month's webinar will be both a continuation and a slight switch from this webinar. Our speakers will be Dr. Jude Capper of Harper Adams University in the United Kingdom and Dr. Sarah Place from Alanco. Both Sarah and Jude are strong advocates for the industry and very active in spreading information outside our industry on a mission to educate the non-ag public beyond the smokescreen that Frank referenced. Sarah was a collaborator on the white paper that Frank referenced. We will meet on July 14th again at 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. We have the information provided by Frank and Jude and Sarah and many others and the information on the CLEAR Center. This next webinar is, is sort of going to be targeting how can we talk about that. There's so much hype beyond, about sustainability and the sustainability that a lot of the nut juice and meat replacement folks are using is a different sustainability than the science would indicate. So that's our target for next month. Again, we will be featuring AMTS office hours 30 minutes prior to the start of each webinar. And then just to know, we do that again tonight. This morning, we had a fantastic conversation between Tom Taluki and Marty Traxler about what they're experiencing with in, in, increased climate heat and how that is affecting cows. So that was pretty good. Come back to our Facebook page if you missed that and you can see the recording. This morning, I was joined, as I mentioned, by L my teammate, Lynn Gilbert, who gave a neat little quick tutorial, Tom Taluki, and Marty Traxler. I have the assistance in ordinary times of some terrific co-hosts, but this month, Elena Bonfante, who usually joins, is not available. She's attending a conference, and we'll have more co-hosts in the afternoons. In the afternoon session, I am joined by AMTS team member Tom Taluki, who can be relied on for knowledge about nearly everything and intelligent conversation, as well as disruption. As a company, we rely on the support, sales, and boots on the ground nutritional knowledge of a network of global distributors. Sean Lee of AnsiTech and our distributor in China assist with the webinar tonight. He and the distributors who joined this morning offer questions and observations based on their personal consulting experiences and regional specific issues. I value their input tremendously. We are also joined by Marcos Neves Piera of the University of Lavras in Brazil. Marcos offers perspective from his region and can be relied on to ask extremely insightful questions. 
Finally, and not at all least, I thank and appreciate my hardworking co-host from Argentina, Paula Torillo of Afina, who is assisted tonight by the translators Miriam Strauss-Strauss and Sylvia Strauss. Paula delivers the webinar in Spanish to an audience in Argentina. I really have these wonderful supportive sponsors who allow us to get speakers and help justify my time commitment to this project. We thank our gold sponsors, Arm and Hammer Animal and Food Production, hashtag science hearted, the Canola Council of Canada, learn more about feeding canola at canolamazing.com, Adina experts in animal nutrition with expertise in plant bioactives, and Proteca, transforming the future of farm animal health. Our silver sponsors are the forage analysis labs of Dairyland Laboratories and Dairy One, both with affiliates around the world. Adiseo, Ruminant Nutrition Solutions to ensure animal performance, and Nova Meal from Novita Nutrition. Our bronze sponsors are Amino Max, Virtus Nutrition, Origination Inc., Balchem, and GlucoBest. Each of these companies support education and research worldwide, and we hope you consider them in your formulation decisions. So with all of that said, I am ready for any questions that anyone might have. Frank, so welcome. So good to have you here. Well, thank you very much for having me, uh, even though I have a little bit of a rustic voice, due to my, <laughs> but I'm doing my best. Thank you. Thank you. And Frank, I saw earlier you had your video started. If you want to run that, I'm pretty sure you can, and people will see it if you feel more comfortable. So I'm waiting on some questions. I think that people were just interested to hear your talk. I have a few that occurred to me whilst listening to it. You referenced feed management, and that's sort of what AMTS is all about, is trying to make sure that people are feeding as precisely as possible with the least amount of excess materials because that will uh, we, we want to optimize it. Frank, do you have background mm -hmm. knowledge on some of the additives that are discussed as anti-methanogens? Oh, certainly. We do a lot of research. I would say between my colleague Ermius Gabriab and my lab, um, we have done the lion's share of feed additive research on methane reduction, enteric methane reduction, that is. Um, as well as a lot of research on reducing other pollutants such as ammonia or nitrates or so. Uh, but uh, right now the hype is all about methane. And here we have done several dozen studies and we have identified approximately 10 feed additives that actually do do the job of reducing enteric methane. And they do so uh, anywhere between 5 to 50%. So the more active or the more aggressive ones, the more effective ones, they could reduce methane almost entirely. I mean, you can go to 80, 90%, but once you go too high, then you're not removing the hydrogen. And that's really the main purpose for methane formation, the hydrogen from the rumen. And so you want to reduce methane or I would say 30, 40, maybe 50%, but not more than that, because there's a biological need for some of that hydrogen to being expelled. But yes, additives are under development. They are unfortunately not available yet at the feed store, except for one, but in the next five years, they will be. How are there um, sustainabilities with regards to continuing? Um, my understanding is the the bacteria will adjust on some of those. What, um, what yes. shows the most promise? So there are various additives, including essential oils, tannins, seaweed, a synthetic um, product called 3NOP. The brand name is Bulvaire. So they work in two different ways. Uh, one, of, one group of additives um, would change the microbial composition in the rumen, main, uh, meaning that those microbes that produce methane would be disfavored and others that don't produce methane would be favored. Um, and in those cases, there are a few additives where there's a rebound, uh, rebound effect where um, the microbes get used to it. 
after a while. But the majority of those additives in that group do not show that rebound effect. Um, so that's one, one type of additives that reduces um, a microbial composition. The second type does not change microbial composition in the rumen, but it changes the enzymatic formation of methane. There are nine enzymatic steps in forming methane in the rumen. And things such as red seaweed, Aspergopsis taxiformis it's called, um, red seaweed on the one side and 3-NOP on the other, these two additives, they take out one of the enzymatic steps. And by taking out any enzymatic step in the methane formation cascade, you don't form methane anymore. And that's what they do. And that's how they work. Um, I want to have one caveat here, and that is that there is no silver bullet, okay? This old saying holds true here as well. Um, those additives without any side effects uh, seem to be working, but at a lower effectiveness uh, range, whereas those that are effective uh, might show some unintended consequences that we have to keep an eye on and, um, and study further. Effects such as toxicological effects or reduced palatability, that the animals eat less. Um, those are effects that are not tolerable and we have to keep an eye on. Okay, thank you. Um, we were recently on a, a trip where I, we, were, we were in Ireland and actually the group that we were with was discussing the research that's being done with, with seaweed um, there and, and the promising possibilities there. Yeah, uh, I have to tell you this, um, the seaweed research that has been done and has been shown to be effective, much and most of it was done here in Davis, um, was on a tropical seaweed, okay, it's mm -hmm. called Aspergopsis taxiformis, and uh, it comes from Australia and from Hawaii, and it has an active ingredient called bromoform, and um, this active ingredient um, does really work in disrupting the, men, uh, the methane uh, enzyme cascade, um, but bromoform is toxic. Uh, it is also a well-known carcinogen, so we have to keep an eye on it. Uh, if you feed it at low concentration, we might not see the unintended consequences, but if we feed it in a higher concentration, we would. We would also uh, see animals uh, eating less. That has been reported in the literature. And that's not tolerable. That's that's not acceptable. So um, more fine tuning has to happen before recommendations can be made. The Irish and others um, go to their beaches and say, "Well, we have all this sea stuff here, all this uh, vegetation in our ocean. Why don't we feed that?" Well, that's not the same right. as red seaweed that grows in Hawaii and in Australia. It's yeah. all about. It's all about the active ingredient in there and not the fact that it's seaweed, okay? So there are thousands of different varieties of seaweed. Uh, very few of them actually have anything to do with, with methane reduction. Yeah, and, and no one would call Ireland tropical. <laughs> I would. <laughs> the fellow that mentioned it, he mentioned research being done at, at Chagas, but he also wasn't, he certainly wasn't an animal nutritionist and I, I didn't know enough to, really ask him very many questions. You should have um, me on your speed dial. Pardon me? You should have me on your speed dial. <laughs> yes, I should have. <laughs> I think you were busy at the time. Um, <laughs> I should sit here, talk to Frank. It, Mar I don't want to, Marty, do you have any questions for, for Dr. Mittler while you're, I don't even say your name right, Frank. I'm sorry, I'm sticking with Frank. Oh, it's, okay. it's like to learn, Mittlerner. Met learner. Very good. Oh, now you are very good. Look at that. <laughs> Marty, go. I don't really, but one thing occurred to me during this discussion um, that was mentioned earlier was some of these uh, feed additives. I am particularly getting people visiting me about wanting to use or, or trying to promote the use of, of uh, additives that contain tannins. Um, it seems they mostly come from quebracho. I guess some of the stuff that I learned from Piet van Seuss was that those um, 
Cabracho is a is a condensed tannin that's very um, has some great effects in binding binding with protein, and it becomes unavailable later on. Um, we're getting into a different area rather than than reducing methane production, but um, I'm kind of interested in what what your thoughts might be on on what impact that has on on animal production, um, aside from the reduction in in uh, greenhouse gas production. Yeah, so um, tannins are an interesting um, group of feed additives. <clears throat> they actually do have the ability to reduce methane, and we are studying it right now. Um, but they are really mainly used to affect nitrogen use efficiency in in cattle. Um, they also have shown to have good impacts on animal performance. So what we are trying to, to find out right now is um, how much of these tenants shall be fed. You don't want to overfeed them because then they become um, an issue with respect to palatability. So you don't want to overfeed them, uh, but you also don't want to feed too little because then you don't see the desired effects. So I have done research, particularly with tenants that stemmed from Cabracho, the one that you are referring to. Cabracho is the ex-breaker tree in Paraguay and so where I was last week, where I got my COVID. <laughs> um, but, um, but this stuff uh, does have an effect. It's not as effective as some of the other feed additives in reducing methane, but it might have... Um, a dual effect of reducing methane and uh, and also unwanted nitrogen excretion. Because let's not forget, while the hype is on methane, uh, equally important is that we keep an eye on nitrogen use efficiency because we don't want too much nitrogen to be excreted by the animals because that nitrogen can become ammonia or nitrite, nitrate, nitrous oxide uh, or other pollutants to air water or climate and um, and here we have to be mindful and so the tenants play an important role and there are other additives i see some of your sponsors like adeseo there on the slide um, they have precision um, essential amino acid nutrition products um, that also serve the the purpose of fine-tuning what animals need so that the excretion of nitrogenous compounds is minimized and uh, performance maximized. So getting the best out of the animal with respect to product while having the least environmental footprint is the objectives of many or most of these companies that work in this sphere. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the questions or points, and Frank, maybe you have some insight on this. I'm going to try to find the slide that referenced um, eating our way out of it. Um, and the yeah. study that was um, done by Hall and White that, that discussed <coughs> becoming yeah. a vegan. Um, have there been studies that have looked at okay, so everybody stops eating meat, stops drinking milk. Let's not even try to suss out what we do with all of those production animals. Are they just immediately stopping their emissions or are they wandering off and dying a happy life? But um, what are the, the environmental costs of needing to grow more protein sources that are, are plant-based? Well, <laughs> First of all, I, I want to emphasize my desire here by talking about this is not to at all downplay veganism or anybody's uh, personal nutritional choice. Okay, so this is not to make fun of them or something, but just to use one extreme form, which is the one of foregoing animal source foods altogether and looking at how that would affect the climate. And it wouldn't really in any major way. Um, but if we were to attempt it, to just forego animal source foods altogether, uh, then that would mean we would not make use of a lot of agricultural land that's currently used to grow livestock. Um, and instead, uh, we would have to drastically increase the arable land. Um, the reason why this is problematic is because the vast majority of 
land used for livestock is called marginal land. And marginal land is called marginal because you cannot grow crops there. So it's 80, it's well over 80% of all land in the world used for livestock that cannot be used to grow crops there. So if we now say we don't use livestock anymore, then, um, then that would mean we would have to grow more crops on land that we don't really have available. We don't have the arable land to replace this nutrient-dense form of nutrition, which our animal source foods are. Um, it's very important to point out to me that um, replacing animal source foods with plant source foods is way more complex than people think. It's not about just getting enough proteins in your body, but quality proteins, okay? Essential amino acids packaged along with a lot of the other essential nutrients that we require, such as iron, calcium, selenium, vitamin B12, in forms that are bioavailable and digestible, okay? And that is what animal source foods do. I always get, uh, I always get a crisis when I hear people say, oh, livestock only uh, satisfy 18% of calories. It's not about calories, ladies and gentlemen. It is about nutrients. We are not calorie deprived, even here in the poorer parts of the United States or the poorer parts of the world. We are in many places nutrient deprived and the best source of nutrient dense food is animal source food. So let's not just be radical about this discussion, but be, um, you know, be rational and think about where these things are produced and why they are produced in those regions. Uh, make the best use of the limited lands we have available globally to produce the best food we know um, we know to grow. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, that it is. It is far more complex. And I was actually at the the conference where Mary Beth Hall introduced the paper that she and Robin had done, and <clears throat> she acknowledges that they gave it. Uh, brief overview without the opportunity or time to dive into some of the more complex parts of that discussion. Harkening back to Ireland, one of the things my husband who ended up being there an extra eight days because of COVID, he listened to a lot of advertisements whilst there in his hotel room. And he said there was an advertisement for Kerry Gold and discussing that it is the most or the, the lowest carbon footprint food cheese or food or whatever available. Can you address that? They are they're primarily on grazing. How how would explain that, please? Uh, I cannot explain that. I, <laughs> is that advertising? <laughs> I do not know uh, any of the background uh, for the advertisement, um, but I assume that <clears throat> that they have done some work on not just how much their cows emit, meaning uh, how much they belch and how much manure they produce, but also um, how much the vegetation that these animals graze on, how much the vegetation sucks out of the air during photosynthesis and stores in the ground as part of soil carbon sequestration. Maybe they have done the mass balance between what cattle put out versus what plants and soils take on. Uh, maybe they have done that calculation. Um, that's the only explanation I have, but I would need to know more to be sure. Yeah, no. <clears throat> if any place is going to be, you know, sucking in the, the unnecessary thing, I think it's Ireland. <laughs> it's just so yeah, lush and green. Ireland, it's New Zealand, but um, there is a lot of controversy over the topic of soil carbon sequestration. Uh, there are some people who say this is a major sink and uh, one third of all human caused carbon is taken on by soil and uh, grazing can increase soil carbon sequestration. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's true. Um, and then, but there are others who say, yes, that is true, but there is a saturation curve. Okay, So soils can only take on so much. And at a certain point, they are saturated with carbon and then they stop taking on new carbon. Um, I think that over the next few years, we will learn that there are differences across soil types. Uh, not everything that's green is also uh, very heavy on the sequestration uh, potential side, 
but um, I think there are massive potentials and those areas um, that rely on that sink uh, really need to do research on how much of that is happening there. Ireland is certainly one, New Zealand, uh, much of South America. Those are areas where um, scientists should really place an emphasis on finding out how much sequestration is possible. And if I remember correctly, you have some really excellent reference materials on the CLEAR website, on the blog, with regards to that process. Yeah, I do. And also explainers and so on. Um, in case your listeners are interested in, um, in certain subject matter topics, for example, what is a digester or how does soil carbon sequestration work or so, you'll find explainers on these topics on the CLEAR Center webpage. Um, and they are very popular and they are also very influential. I'm always blown away how many hundreds of thousands of people download them and, and learn these topics. Firstly, Frank, welcome back to the afternoon session. Hello, how are you? Very well, thanks. I think I have it set up so we should see you, but I maybe need to. Yes, you just that. have to. Yeah, you just have to switch there your camera we go. around. There we go. Are we good? Can you see me? I think you need to switch your camera. Yeah, let me see. Show grid video. No, when, when you speak, Frank, you show up. It rotates through whoever's the. the between oh. you and Marianne, yeah. No, all's good. That's what I thought. <laughs> okay, but I don't see it and Frank doesn't see it probably either. Thanks, Tom, for, for sharing that. Hi, for a second. No, I speak for a second and I still don't see myself, but maybe- uh, We maybe. see you. Oh, you see me, okay. Okay, yep, perfect. You look, you look a little bit more elected than this morning. <laughs> You yeah, know. because now now it's not now it's not six o'clock in the morning for me. <laughs> oh my goodness, I am sorry about that. Oh no, not at all. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm she's not here. really sorry. She's not really sorry. <laughs> well, I yeah. wouldn't be sorry if it were you, Tom. We know. Uh, we know. <laughs> yes. So, also, Marcos, thank you for joining us, and Sean and Paula, would you all like to say hello? Hi, hello, Frank. Thank you for the for the webinar. It was a, a really great webinar. You are welcome. Are you in Argentina? Yes, we are here in Argentina now. I was in your beautiful country last week. Yes. Oh, in Buenos where, Aires. Yeah, in, ah. in Buenos Aires. And oh, that's Buenos not really that, that's not Argentina. Thank Buenos Aires. <laughs> it's another country. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> It's like saying you were in New York. Yeah, well, no. <laughs> Sean, hello. Hi, Frank. This is Sean. Well, I'm taking care of the business in China, but I live in Canada. Oh, so. <laughs> I've been to China many. I've been to China many times. I used to have. I do have an associate professor title at a Chinese university. I spent a lot of time there. Yeah, I heard of that. Uh, you you went to Northwest Agriculture University. That's where Correct. I got my my bachelor and a master degree. Yeah, <laughs> it's a small world. It's a small world. Yeah, quite a few people told me about you. Actually, I I, I meant to send you an invitation because I also broadcast this talk, this specifically this talk in Chinese to the Chinese nutritionist. Oh, great. Maybe in August. Uh, I need to uh, ask you for uh, half an hour of your time. Just after I play this one, and then uh, maybe there are some questions. I hope you can make that. Of course, absolutely. It will be my pleasure. Okay, thank you so much. The The talk is excellent. Actually, I, I gave a, a presentation last week uh, online again into China. Uh, dairy uh, farming industry about um, the silage management, but uh, oh, yeah. I, I I stole some of your slides and your ideas, your explanations, because I explained the silage management uh, from the low carbon footprint uh, angle. Uh, 
that you guys, uh, you know, the drama at loss and uh, in the field, in the bunker and the diet formulation. And if you can make every steps, you tighten that, reduce losses, just like you mentioned in the last slides about the food waste. Yeah. Uh, forage waste in the field that in the bunker also is huge. So yeah, it's it's actually people received that uh, quite a well. Thank you. Well, you're most welcome. All right, Sean, we'll cir circle back around to you for questions okay. later. I just want to welcome Marcos and give him an opportunity to greet Frank. Yeah. Hi. Good night. And Frank, thanks, Frank, for the for the talk. And I am from Brazil, and but uh, I am in Canada to August, <laughs> September. I'm going going back. Thanks Everyone's in Canada. <laughs> And I was in Brazil, and I was in Brazil three weeks ago. If you consider Sao Paulo Brazil, but oh, I yes. do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it seems like people on this webinar you argue uh, about geography. So I just to <laughs> yeah, no. Actually, it's a, it's a big part of Brazil. <laughs> lot, lot, lots of people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But thanks for the talk. It was really very, very well done. Okay. You're welcome. You know what I found amazing about Brazil? When I went there, there was a methane conference, a livestock methane conference, and there were hundreds of people, most of which were producers, most of which were producers, okay, on a several day methane conference. So the, the Brazilians have really understood how important this is. Yeah, that, that, that's really important. It's getting everybody <laughs> everywhere, yep. definitely. Yep. It must be. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, Marcus. I'm going to lead off with Tom. You and I were discussing before. Just you, you recently attended the Cornell advanced course in dairy. And you said, I, I expect it was probably Mike Van Amberg maybe talked a little bit about byproducts and how much of the almond industry how much of that goes into cattle feed as a percentage and you and i were asking you know i asked you a question about well what happens with i'm sure there's byproducts from the making of almond juice and you didn't know but frank probably maybe knows um where that is utilized if that's also turned into a cattle feed uh, so Almond hulls, of course, fed to dairy cows, and uh, they are very valuable feed additive. Oh, not feed additive, feed component. Uh, but, you know, there's so much. I mean, about half of the diet that goes into our dairy cows in the state uh, is co-products and byproducts from crop production. Uh, the reason why we have 20% of the U.S. dairy herd in California is because we have so much plant production. And without the cows, all of these co-products, byproducts would be rotting under the sun or going to landfills, but now they're going into a cow's rumen to produce you know, meat and milk. And so about 20% of all co-products, byproducts in California end up in a cow's rumen. We are nature's recyclers. Yeah, you know, we are nature's recyclers, that's true. And uh, maybe most importantly, we are nature's upcyclers. And what that means is that we take things that are non-human edible, such as grasses of all kinds and other forages, and, you know, they just contain a bunch of cellulose, and we make some of the most amazing food from it. And that's called upcycling, upcycling of nutrients. So we recycle and we upcycle, and we don't emphasize that enough because that's a very important role of ruminants. Unfortunately, it has the unintended consequence of something like methane, but that too we can manage. Well, and, and that's a good point, Frank. And, and it, it's one of those where I look at it as, and it really bugs me be, because as, as you so well stated, and I, I'd love to hear it, the methane that, that we produce from cows is, recycled carbon it, it's we're, we're we're 
you know, oh, not all of it. You know, if we look at, you know, urea that might have been used as a fertilizer. So there's a little bit that's that's new carbon or ancient carbon, as you as you put it. But the vast majority of it is we're we're recycling carbon through through the system. Yeah, I think I understand why regulators like to look at at animal agriculture for for you know some two pretty simple reasons one is we're a small industry and and we have historically as we've been put under new regulations what do we usually see uh, everyone pisses and moans and bitches and complains and then we adapt historically that's been pretty easy though because how have we adapted Typically, we've added more cows, but with all the environmental constraints and land constraints that we're under now, we can't really do that. So we're kind of stuck. The other is they're they're thinking so many regulators and policymakers are, are looking at short term. If we can reduce methane, the, the, the heating potential of it's so much greater that if we can reduce it, we can we can control warming potential quick. But it doesn't take into account we continue to add new car more and more carbon sources to the system we, we really need to be thinking about this from a, a societal systematic approach of, of how do we stop adding new carbon and, and people don't want to hear that because it, it's a force in in change in in human behavior mm -hmm. uh, so it, it it's it's kind of a kind of an interesting uh, dichotomy that that we're stuck under well, to, to me, yeah. to me, uh, to me, what is really important here is that a loss of methane from either the cow or from the manure of the cow, loss of methane is a loss of energy. Uh, so about 10% or so of the energy we feed to cows gets lost as enteric methane. And a good chunk of the methane that comes from animal manure gets lost to the air. These losses, these energy losses, equate to financial losses. And if we reduce these losses, then we can turn something that many people consider a problem, which is methane, into an opportunity. And I, I really want to go there. I really want to get the industry to understand this is only a problem if we allow it to be a problem. It can be an opportunity if we so wish. Okay. So let's go down that path a little bit. Because I, I was thinking about all of these uh, uh, additives and, and things that are in development to mm -hmm. reduce methane emissions from cows. Now, let, let, let's take one of them, like, like 3 nap. Where's the carbon balance? The carbon balance doesn't make any sense. If, if we try and look at the reduction in, in, in methane emissions, that carbon's got to go somewhere. We don't see it in more milk. We don't see it in improved feed efficiency. Maybe it goes to body condition score. So there's a, there's there's a lot of questions there related to it, but I th I think the bigger question to me is, and and we've done this as a society multiple times. We 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 look at how to fix a problem quick without thinking about the long term impacts. Okay, that being said, the methanogens are an ancient bacteria. They have survived millions of years, all different types of scenarios, and, and the rumen. The rumen bacteria and the cow is a symbiotic relationship. One can't live without the other. For any of us to believe that the methanogens won't evolve to become immune to some of these additives that we're trying. It might take 20 years, but I, I can't believe that, that <coughs> we won't see, we'll, we'll see an initial reduction in methane if we do some of these things. But then, is that going to be sustained? And I don't, yeah. I don't, evolutionary wise, I don't, I don't see how that could be possible because the methanogens wouldn't have survived for millions of years. Yeah. So there are two different groups of feed additives, uh, and that's really important to emphasize. There are two different bins with respect to feed additives. Um, the one bin is the one you're referring to. These are additives that change the microbial composition in the rumen away from methane forming into what other uh, microbes and these are essential oils and tenons and uh, you know, they're all a bunch of those uh, 
and they reduce methane by 10 or so percent. But some of them, by the way, have a beneficial impact on animal performance, for example, feed efficiency. We've done several dozen studies on several of these compounds, and most of them didn't work. Some of them did even over long time uh, studies uh, maintain a, a beneficial impact on, let's say, feed efficiency or milk components and yield. Um, so that's the one bin. But the other bin, and you just referred to one member of that bin, 3NOP, there are others. The second bin does not affect microbial composition in the rumen, but it affects the enzymatic production of methane only. So there are, two, there are nine enzyme, enzymatic steps needed to produce methane, and 3NOP and several other uh, new uh, additives take one of those enzymatic steps and break it, break the chain. And if you feed a little bit of this stuff, you reduce a little bit methane. If you feed a whole lot, then you reduce a lot of methane. So much so that you will then, when you reduce it by too much, you affect animal performance. For example, if you feed a lot of 3NOP, you can get 80%, 80 percent, 80 percent of methane reduction. But at that level, you will affect performance of cows. If you, however, go to 40%, you will not affect performance of cows. And the microbial composition is in no way affected. It's only the, the enzymatic cascade that's affected. And so that's what makes this second bin uh, quite interesting indeed. Okay. <laughs> Short term, but, but if we start looking at, and, and, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, yeah, okay, we can see that on one lactation cycle, two lactation cycles, maybe three, but let's talk 10 years, let's talk 15 years, 20 years, you know, let, let's think about the, the development of antibiotic resistance in, in any pathogenic bacteria, mm -hmm. because a lot of them mm -hmm. do the same thing, interfere with one enzyme that, that, that stop it being pathogenic or whatever, they mm -hmm. evolve, and, and, and we end up back to the original challenge. And, and I'm just afraid that as an industry, we're going to go down a path and, and stop doing research on other potential avenues to address this. For example, yeah, no, could, no, absolutely. Could, we, could we get into plant genetics and, and, and changing, you know, some of the work that Van Amberg's group's doing now on, on, on evaluating mm -hmm. methane predictions. And, and it's really that the correlation between cellulitic content and methane is very positive. Whereas the, the correlation between hemicellulose and methane is negative. So can we change, you know, should, can we be looking at changes in plant genetics and, and species that we use and, and reduce the basic methane potential to begin with? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So first of all, I by no means say that feed additives are the silver bullet and we now need to chase down that, that, that silver bullet. Although I think they are an important uh, tool in our toolbox. And, and for, some, for some producers, they will work really well. Uh, and by the way, we already have a situation in California, for example, where large companies like Nestle and Starbucks are paying their dairy suppliers the cost of the feed additives uh, so that they reduce their, their methane footprint on the farm. And by doing so, they, the Nestle's and Starbucks, then reduce their overall footprint. And they're actually requiring their suppliers to do that. So that's already happening today. But I don't want to be uh, on the record as someone saying it is only covered lagoon slash digesters or feed additives, and that's it. Uh, I'm just back over the last, well, I mean, the very recent history, visiting four countries in South America, Uruguay, Brazil, Argentina and uh, Brazil. And what I found was that, for example, on the reproductive efficiency side of things, uh, there are huge improvements ne uh, necessary and possible. Uh, the reproductive rate and the conception rate is extremely low under grazing conditions uh, in the pampa of, of some of those areas, some of those countries. We're talking about 50% or so. In, in some other regions, they are slaughtering beef animals uh, when these animals are about uh, 300 kilos. Uh, why? Because uh, 
they don't have the hanging ability to uh, to hang heavier carcasses and so the animals are slaughtered way early way early and we would never do that in in a country like that so when you consider all the other management and husbandry and, and, and so on components, there are so many levers we can play with in order to improve herd efficiencies uh, and with doing so or by doing so, reduce environmental footprint. It is amazing. And let's not forget this. Let's not forget this. 80%, 80 percent, eight zero of the world's livestock's carbon footprint occurs in developing countries and emerging countries. That is where the uh, where the eight hundred uh, pound gorilla sits, and uh, here we have huge opportunities to make improvements. Spend a lot of time in China. Uh, I can tell you, China and Brazil, these two countries together, have more cattle than the rest of the world combined. If we work with uh, countries like that and help them to improve efficiencies and so on, we have a massive opportunity to reduce environmental footprint, particularly climate footprint of global livestock. Totally agree with you, Frank. It, it's, and, and I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's, we need to be thinking about this from a systematic approach and everything that we can do to address the issue. Yep. And, people, and people are not saying that or hearing that when we do say it. Yeah, and I think uh, part of the reason why they are not hearing it is the the people who are shouting the loudest that we need to make changes they are not really in the area and they don't really understand the subtleties of our area and we who are in the area are actually not doing a very good job communicating uh, and that is where we really have to improve because a growing number of people now wants to know where the food comes from how it's produced and how it should be eaten and not be wasted and so on and they are looking for experts, but most of the experts don't really want to communicate with those people who want to know. That has to change, and I, for myself, have changed that. So I, you're, 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 let, let me let me finish with this, Marianne. You're absolutely yeah. right, Frank. We're, we're we need good spokespeople from an industry. The the unfortunate thing is, in many cases, because this is true in the animal welfare arena as well, that if we start we are very good at talking facts and figures and the other side is very good at talking emotion and if we and if we start trying to go down that emotion path we're accused of being in big industries pockets and we're biased and don't believe us we need to find people that can walk that balance with the with the reputation and the, and build that level of trust with the general public mm -hmm. So and I will I'm, be quiet now. No, 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 you don't have to be, but I'm going to use that as a segue and a push for our webinar for next month, which is going to have Jude Capper and Sarah Place. And the goal of that is to actually give us some tools to, to do that. I, Frank, between Frank, Sarah, and Jude, I think they've been tremendous advocates and tremendous speakers. I'm hoping that we can we can take that and multiply it by, by just some of the information and how to do it. As Jude said today, when I talked to her, she said, we've got to learn not to bludgeon people with science and facts, which is what we do. And, and to just say, well, you're just not listening to it and therefore you're stupid. We have to understand where they're coming from, where their fears are, and then try to address that. I'm going to, we have a couple questions in the question window. I'm going to go next to Paula. I know she has some questions from Argentina, and then we'll circle back around to the questions I have here. Go, Paula. Okay, yes. I, I had a, a few questions, but now I have many questions. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first question is, how does a climate change impact uh, the profitability of a company and what are the assumptions of the analysis if you have it how does climate change affect uh, the profitability of what kind of company uh, an animal company a livestock company or 
What kind of yes, company? dairy farms. Well, that totally depends on on where you are. Uh, so, of course, climate change uh, can have impacts with respect to causing irregular weather weather patterns. You know, heat waves and so on that can affect a farm. And uh, you know, heat is a significant problem. Heat waves and a significant problem throughout the world. Uh, that is one thing. Another one is that a changing climate is also answered by many companies now is answered with changes in public policy for example in new zealand they're just starting now a a tax for greenhouse gases so if you are a livestock producer in new zealand you now have to pay a tax for nitrous oxide you have to pay a tax for methane uh, so there's a financial burn uh, currently that's only there but I'm certain that other countries in the world will watch how that's going. Uh, and, and then there are multiple other ways as to how climate change can affect financial viability of livestock. I think it's very important that we follow the science, uh, but also explain to policymakers why it's so important to them to follow the science, because otherwise they make, the, they make decisions that may drive out their producers so the products that their producers used to produce will then be, be produced elsewhere and with it the emissions will be, be will be produced elsewhere a process called leakage really not something that we want to see throughout the world and paul one of the things we're doing um i'm starting to formulate ideas for next month's web or next year's webinars and we discussed that it would probably be a really good follow-up to this one to talk about how heat stress can affect productivity, both epigenetically through calves that suffer as fetuses with heat stress, how do they go on to produce less, and also just how it affects the cows in their current lactation. So that's, that's coming up next. I am going to, Paula is going to take a little bit of a breather for a second, and then I'm going to ask a couple questions. So we've got some, Nelson Lobos is writing in the question window, and I'm going to lump all of these together. And I think this comes around to, it's a big, it's a big issue, and there are lots of areas. But so his first part is, with pertaining to excess food waste, should we be focusing on reducing dry matter losses at the silo and at that rather than the enteric methanes with add additives? What would be the net effect? Would that be greater in, presenting, in preventing CO2 losses, having the dry matter fed to the cow be trading the emission to methane? And then, so, uh, yeah, it's systems. <laughs> so, so, so you can see it that, all. Yeah. Yeah. The answer to that is um, there are regions where dry matter losses from silage are unbelievably high. In California, they average 20%. And so, to me, that's unacceptable. And to me, that needs a laser sharp focus to, to work, work on. And I've seen it because I've studied it that these losses can be reduced drastically. But would I would I suggest to do that in lieu of reducing enteric methane? No, definitely not. I would say that we have to do the one in addition to the other, not the least because we have now laws that mandate reduction of methane by 40%. We need all the tools available to achieving those goals that are set uh, for our industry. I think it's safe to say we've moved from an either or to an and. Correct. Paula, would you like to, do you have more questions? Yes. Go uh, for it. <laughs> okay. Uh, when using the, the manure in fermentation chambers, the digestors, uh, it is the, the material is not reaching the soil where it is extracted that in the long term would generate an environmental damage. So lowering the microorganisms from the soil or the, the organic matter of the soil. No, no. 
So if you have, let's first start with the dairy that does not have a, a cover, no, no digester. Uh, that manure, that lagoon water would sooner or later be used to be applied as fertilizer to the crops. Uh, if you now cover the lagoon, then you extract the biogas, particularly the methane from that uh, manure, but the N, P and K and the other nutrients remain in the effluent. It's called the digestate. So the stuff, the liquid in the digester will eventually make its way onto the field as if it were just a normal regular lagoon. And it does not lose nutritional value to the feed crops. So uh, the answer to that is no. The only difference between uh, untreated lagoon water versus covered lagoon water in a digester is that the covered lagoon water uh, has more inorganic nitrogen to it, more ammonia to it. Uh, so that's the only difference, okay? But if you manage the nitrogen appropriately and at agronomic rates, you should not have a problem. Okay, perfect. Uh, Marianne, may I go on or are you? Yeah, going why to... don't you um, why don't you go on with a few and then I'll see if Marcos and Sean Lee would like to ask questions or if Tom and Tom go ahead and um, unmute and talk if there's anything that you want to offer. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, yeah, there, there's a couple things I want to jump in on this way. I want to go back to, to this, this whole idea about minimizing silage loss, losses as well. You know, we're dealing with, with, with a time now with fuel prices, energy prices where they are. And, and if we look at the value of that silage that, that, that we harvested, and if we're dealing with 20% losses in the silo, okay, or even 10% losses, the, the, the raw financial impact of that on the farm, you know, especially now, you know, with, I mean, standing wheat, I heard for wheat silage in California is, you know, out in the fields, a hundred bucks a ton this year. We're dealing with really expensive crops. This is no longer that forages are cheap. This is yeah. real money we're talking. And, and, and then the other thing with the digesters that people should consider is by putting, by having these things covered, we're not adding all the atmospheric water from rainfall into that. So our, our actual manure disposal costs, again, fuel costs, labor costs, tires, you figure out, uh, you know, you take a, 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 a manure storage that, that's uh, uh, 100 meters across and, and you look at how many liters of rainwater that get added to that and how many truckloads of manure that is to get out into the field, we're talking real money. So there's a financial incentive to do some of these things just from day-to-day -day operations as well. Yeah. So on the on the silage thing, I think it was I think it was my lab that started this whole uh, major research into the environmental management of silages to reduce emission losses. Uh, at the time when I was first speaker at the International Silage Conference people looked at me like, what? That's unbelievable how much VOCs they measure at UC Davis coming from silages. And I asked them, well, what did you think? What did you think the losses uh, are caused by? And people didn't know. I mean, these are dry metal losses. These are not liquid losses. These are dry metal losses. And uh, what we found was that the reason why these losses were so high is because we are storing that silage in these huge mounds these mounds have an enormous face, and we only defacing about half a foot or so of half of the face every day. And anything that's volatilizable, anything that can go from the silage into the air, will go into the air within 24 hours. And so this is where we found vast amount of gas losses, but even greater losses occur when you take the inside material and you put it in front of the cows. If you feed once a day, if you feed your cows once a day and you have that silage in your TMR, then anything that's volatilizable will be volatilized, meaning will have gone into the air within the time it sits there and waits to be eating, being eaten. So we have published all of that. We have a couple dozen papers on uh, silage and environmental management and dry matter losses and how to reduce those dry matter losses. 
I think it's an extremely important topic. And particularly now that feed is so important, I totally agree with you. Okay, Paula, did you wanna follow up? And then Marcos has a question. Okay, perfect. Uh, Roberto asks, considering you had, if, if you had two identical cows, twins, what would you do to make them produce less methane? considering that the rumen is also an anaerobic biodigester. So why do these two have to be identical? I, I don't know why the, the two cows, but <laughs> what would you do in the rumen to make them uh, produce less methane? So the first thing I would do, because we are now talking about reducing, uh, reducing pretty much not just the carbon footprint of that cow, but the environmental footprint. The most important thing when reducing environmental footprint of an animal is to make it as efficient as possible. Uh, and so genetics are one prime tool uh, at our disposal. Nutrition is one, of course, uh, but a very important one, oftentimes undervalued is reproductive efficiency. Uh, it is extremely important that we optimize reproductive efficiencies because if we can't get a cow pregnant and she is open for too long then that equates to uh, if you look at a whole herd a large need for large replacement herds and these animals eat and excrete but they don't produce milk and so they are overall a significant contributor to the environmental footprint of that dairy uh, with respect to uh, the individual cow i would carefully look at what the roughage sources are that the animals get uh, to eat. Uh, roughage is uh, the substance and the substrate that generates the methane. Our cows need roughage, of course, uh, but you know, I would look at what source of roughage can be fed. I would also look what source of, of fats are there and, uh, and other uh, ingredients that we know can have an impact on on the microbes, such as essential oils, tannins, and so forth. Uh, and in the future, I would also look into other additives. I do think that, and I have already seen one, an additive that costs about four cents uh, per cow per day to being fed, can generate up to 50 cents per cow per day in increased performance, and particularly feed efficiency improvements. Because uh, I wanna state that again, if you reduce these energy losses, uh, then some of that energy can be recouped. And we have found some of the pathways in several of the additives that are possible. Okay, Paula, you said you had a follow-up question. Paula? She's speechless. I think my internet <laughs> connection is, is not working. Oh properly. dear. Okay, uh, I, I have a, a question related to, to this one. You told us the one of the most important practices to reduce environmental impact would be uh, reproductive efficiency, uh, which uh, can you mention another important practices to uh, lower our environmental impact in, in a dairy farm? Well, I would also say that a reduction of stress uh, would be very advantageous. Um, <clears throat> we, don't want, <clears throat> we don't want to have animals that are subjected to, uh, to environmental stress and to social stress. The less of a a stressful environment animals have, the relatively better is their uh, performance and the lower is their environmental footprint. For example, if you were to have a free stall with, with 100 cows uh, or built for 100 cows, but you actually run it with more than 100 cows, you run it with 110 or 120 cows because you feel like that's uh, more cost effective or so, then we can assume that some of those cows don't have a comfortable resting place. And we can also assume that over time, some of those animals that have substandard conditions 
will show signs of uh, discomfort or uh, or stress and will have potential health impacts, potential reproductive impacts, and so on. I think it is very important for us to really use a One Health approach and consider not just nutrition, but also husbandry and housing on the one hand, uh, as well as as well as uh, animal nutrition in order to optimize uh, the welfare of animals. I think it's all linked. It's uh, not one topic being important or the other. These topics are all important and we should make all of them a priority. Great, thank you. All right. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you, Frank. Um, let's, I'm gonna move to a question from Marcos Neve Piera. Hi, hi, Frank. Uh, I was just thinking about the, I think you, you said a good numbers about the California, the use of the digestors reduced to, I think, 30% of the GA, GA, G emissions. I, I would like to know, you know, in proportion, how much of that would be nitrogen and how much would be methane? I'm thinking because like for confined cattle, we have a, a big issue that that's the mixing of urine and manure happens at the feed bank. So it's totally different from a, a grazing system, for example, where a cow can, can defecate in one place and urinate in another place. So we basically mix those things in instantaneously. And so how our digestor, is it effective to, for retaining this more of this nitrogen, especially the nitrogen? And it, I don't know if you know this number, how, how much of this reduction is methane and how much is yeah. some kind of nitrogen emission? Yeah, I know the numbers. The 30% reduction of greenhouse gases is completely methane. All of it is methane. Uh, and actually I should say that in my slide. Uh, and the reason why we know this, that it's all methane is because all that methane is being metered because the biogas from the digesters is metered when it leaves the dairy uh, because it becomes transportation fuel and is then being put into semi-trucks and buses. So we know exactly how much methane is produced on these dairies because it is being put in, into a tank of a vehicle. And so that 30% of methane reduction of greenhouse gas reduction is completely methane. Um, we do not have, as, as part of anaerobic digestion, we, have, we do not have a sizable reduction of nitrous oxide, but we do have an impact on nitrogen. When you use a covered lagoon or any kind of anaerobic digester, then you convert some of the organic nitrogen in the lagoon water into inorganic nitrogen. And here in particular into ammonium, which readily then becomes ammonia when you land apply to crops. So you have to be mindful that when you land apply what's called the digestate, what comes out of a digester, when you land apply that, then most of it is in its organic form. And there is a potential for that effluent from the digest, uh, digester to cause more ammonia emissions. So that totally depends upon how and when you land apply it and whether you land apply that lagoon water at agronomic rates. Oh, thank you. I just have another question, actually an opinion. Like for example, we all talk about natural feed additives like essential oils, tannins, everything. But I would say mm -hmm. that the monanzin is very effective also. But we cannot talk about monanzin just because it's an antibiotic. Consumers don't want that word, but it's an antibiotic that can be good for the atmosphere. So do you think we can, we could go back sometimes? For example, monanzin is good for cow health. Monanzin is good for the environment. Is it, is it possible or we, we I'll say the, the solution is essential oil, tannins and, and whatever, fat and... Okay. Yeah, so so I would say that most cows uh, and cattle here in the United States fed romancing. I mean, it's uh, it's pretty much everybody I talk to feeds romancing. Uh, but 
and and some studies have suggested that rumensin can reduce enteric methane, but most studies have found the opposite that it doesn't uh, affect methane over the long run. I have done studies myself where I fed rumensin at four levels, all the way up to the highest level, and I did not find a continuous reduction of methane over the long term. So I don't think that romancing is a uh, necessarily a tool to affect methane, but it is a tool to affect performance and improve health. And that also has an impact on the environmental footprint of cows. In general, people are people in developed countries. So in most European countries and also here in North America are very, very careful or are very negative actually about any kind of antibiotic uh, substance and i own of course would fall into that category uh, in in um, in food animals and i don't see that going back i don't see that going back i think we have kind of been asleep behind the wheel in animal agriculture and it's very difficult to undo that just look at bst you know, RBST, you know, also something that is very effective. It has been used for so long. Uh, it does a great job also on environmental parameters, but we allowed that tool to be uh, pretty much taken away from parts of our industry now. And so we have to be more mindful in the future before these kind of things happen. Same thing goes for GMO feeds. I yep. want to. I want to. I want to come back to the Rumenson one because it's just, I, 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 I've got a funny story with with Rumenson. So about oh god, it's probably close to twenty years ago. A, a herd that I work with has a methane digester, and for years they had fed lasalicid to the lactating cows. When Rumenson became legal, I uh, <clears throat> put the herd. We went from zero to. I think I went to 400 milligrams per cow in one full swoop. <clears throat> <clears throat> the methane digester went, they went from having, they generated electricity. They were selling excess electricity on the grid. Within a month, they didn't have enough gas production to keep the, the cover inflated. So it, it does initially reduce methane production, but the methane, the, the digester group that this farm is part of, uh, they put the question out to them and they're like, oh yeah, you can, you can train the digester to, to work with, with Menensin. You just have to introduce it slowly. What's that tell you? Those methanogens evolve. <laughs> yeah, that, that's my comment. That's my comment too. When we did our trial, we did it a long, a long, um, so we, we used it for half a year. So we found an effect in the short term, but not in the long term. Okay, um, <laughs> this is a, this has been so interesting. Paula, let's come back to some questions from you. And then Sean, I'm gonna ask you if you have anything you wanna ask or if you will wait until you have Frank on your own. <laughs> well, I don't, yeah, I don't I think, think Sean will, I, I, I don't think Sean will have me on his own for quite a while because they, they won't let me. Yeah. <laughs> they won't let me to China. <laughs> Well, it's going to be a, a online, online event. Uh, oh, um, online, yeah, yeah. yeah, online will work. Yeah. yeah, we'll see. Maybe next year we can go there in person. Maybe for this even year, though, I, even I though, e even though I'm now quadruple vaccinated and I just uh, went through COVID, so I'm very safe. I'm very <laughs> safe to visit. <laughs> yeah, I have the triple vaccine, but still, it's uh, they have not um, admit. They don't want to admit. COVID will not go away. It takes time. Yeah, let, let, let them to, 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 to do that way. Eventually, it takes time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, really, I, I, my, some question I have, I had Tom and uh, Frank and guys already discussed. So I, I'm not, uh, I don't have any extra questions. Thank you, Maria. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for joining as always. Paula, back to you for more questions. Okay, I'm ready. Good. 
So, uh, Frank, you you told something about nitrogen, uh, and we have a question: How does nitrous uh, oxide behave in terms of its production and accumulation, and is it possible to reduce it? Yeah. So, nitrous oxide is actually a super important gas. So if, if methane is 28 times more potent than CO2, nitrous oxide is 265 times more potent than CO2. And nitrous oxide is not short-lived. It's a long-lived climate pollutant. So you can, you can tell by how I frame this uh, that I think nitrous oxide is, is one of the most underrated greenhouse gases, okay? Uh, it is a super potent and long-lived gas. So how is it produced? It's produced when you take nitrogen fertilizer whether that's synthetic fertilizer or uh, organic fertilizer, meaning uh, animal manure, when you take that to the crops and you then incorporate that. Once you do it, once you put inorganic nitrogen into the ground, two processes occur. One is called nitrification. The other one is called denitrification. Nitrification is the process from ammonium into nitrite, nitrate, that's the nitrification. And then the denitrification from nitrate into nitrous oxide. And then if it continues all the way to the end of the process, it would go from nitrous oxide to nitrogen gas, N2. So depending upon what the microbial and what the physical characteristics in the soil, what they are with respect to pH and temperature and redox potential and so on, the whole process goes all the way to the end or it stops earlier. When it stops earlier, then it can be that the final product is nitrous oxide, which then comes out of the ground and goes into the air. So we can actually, we can manage the soils in a way that we reduce nitrous oxide. Uh, farmers for the most part don't know how to do it, but researchers have found ways to do that. And, uh, in the future, I think that we will be much more active in, in doing so. Maybe one quick story. I have done research here at UC Davis on a bio, it's called a biofilter. Uh, it also uses worms. The worms are not so important in this context, but uh, it is a aerobic filter onto which you sprinkle lagoon water from the dairy. You sprink, sprinkle the lagoon water to the top. And then the water percolates through the filter and exposes the lagoon water to aerobic microbes. And when the company first told me that this filter can reduce 90% of nitrogen compounds, I laughed at them. I didn't believe it. I did two years worth of research and I found that 90% of nitrogen was reduced. So the question now will be, where is it going? Because it didn't become you know, ammonia or nitrous oxide or so. Where did it go? It went all the way to the end process of nitrification, denitrification, and became nitrogen gas, which is the main constituent of our atmosphere. Long story to a short question, but I think nitrogen is such a fascinating topic and I love it. So once you start me on that one, you'll get long answers. Mm -hmm. Great. Hey, Maria, may I ask one more? Yes, yes, please, Paula, do. Okay. Um, it seems that the hydroxy reaction is of a huge importance. Would it be of interest to increase hydroxyls in the rumen to lower methane? Improving ruminal fermentation would reduce methane. Uh, that is, sorry. <laughs> To, so to make a, a, a more efficient anaerobic uh, fermentation. Uh, no, I don't think that that's possible to get the hydroxyl oxidants into, into the room. They are very reactive. Uh, what we really want is we, have, we want to have them in the atmosphere. And, and we have plenty of them in the atmosphere. These things are the main sink of methane in the world. Okay, but there's something that makes this whole story even more interesting. Tom might be interesting, interested in that as well in this, in this little spin. Uh, so the methane that's produced in different regions in the world 
is always met by hydroxyl radicals, except for regions where there is something else in the air. And that something else is CO, carbon monoxide. These hydroxyl radicals, they prefer to oxidize carbon monoxide over oxidizing methane. So in regions where there's a lot of carbon monoxide, these hydroxyl radicals reduce the carbon monoxide and leave the methane intact. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the reason why there are regions in the world where we find a lot of methane, even though we don't expect it to be there. And the reason why that is, is because in those areas, they produce both carbon monoxide and methane. And the hydroxyl radicals kill the carbon monoxide and leave the methane intact. That is why there's a ton of methane when you look at methane from space that you find over West Africa, Northern India, and all over China, but very little in the rest of the world. That is why. So it's not just a question of managing methane, but it's also a question of managing carbon monoxide if you want to reduce the impact, the warming impact of methane. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. You have great questions, Paula. She does. She has a good, uh, she, they always good questions from Argentina. Um, unless Paula, Tom, Marco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait a minute. I'm intrigued. Go for it. Carbon, I know. This, it's like this, so this carbon monoxide <laughs> interaction, that, that is really wild. So that is wild. Do you, you think that that's kind of nature's way of trying to detoxify it? something that would harm humans and, and doesn't supplant plant growth. I do not know what, you know, whether that's, uh, <laughs> I don't know what I can tell you is that that's what happens. And what I can also tell you is for some reason, the world doesn't really act upon it and notice it and so on. I mean, think about what that means. It means the whole methane picture has just become way more complicated. Because in the United oh, yeah. States, if you look oh, at our wild. methane from space, it, if you look at our methane from space, you find methane not in the areas with the most cattle. You found methane. You find methane in the United States over the Dakotas and parts of West Texas, where we have both uh, incomplete burning of fossil fuels and other things at the same time as methane from fracking. And, and that's why we find it in those areas. Other than that, we don't find very much methane in the United States at all. We do, however, find a lot of methane in West Africa. And that is because the CO, the carbon monoxide, comes over the ocean from Brazil, from burning of natural forests, hits West Africa. And there, the methane that's emitted from various sources is now undisturbed because the CO is being gobbled up by hydroxyl radicals. And, and then I could go on. In, in, in China, the reason why they have so much is because they have both a ton of uh, CO producing industries, as well as a ton of, of methane, particularly in the Northeast. And that is why the clouds of methane over China are unprecedented in the world. So and you can see all of that when you go to a NASA, to a NASA methane depiction, it will show you even in a video format, where in the world you find methane. And if none of that makes sense, then think back to what Frankie told you about hydroxyl radicals and how they prefer CO over CH4. Okay, Tom, are you going to say anything? Now, Thomas B. No, 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 no. I walked over to my iPad so I could look up NASA. <laughs> okay. I'm good. I'm good. Intrigued is all hell. Yeah. Um, good. I, so, Paula has a couple questions about silage. And she said, is, but first, is carbon monoxide more toxic than carbon dioxide? More toxic to whom? Is it toxic? Yes, it is toxic. Yes, it yeah. is toxic. And CO2 is really not toxic. CO2 is a very important gas needed for plant life. Uh, you know, CO2 is uh, very important uh, to life on Earth. Uh, 
but it is also heat trapping and that's why uh, it's considered a challenge. <laughs> Paula, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Paula was, the, was <laughs> born ready. I was going to say, it's more like, is, it, it, is Frank ready? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a better question, Tom. That's right. <laughs> no, I know you're ready. Okay. Um, the, the next question is, uh, if the use of additives uh, to reduce the aerobic phase of the silage making, uh, with that additives, can we reduce the production of CO2? Can we reduce the production of CO2? Is that the question? Yes. Adding additives to reduce the aerobic phase of the silage. So there are two phases where the silage is aerobic. Uh, at the beginning of ensiling, the first four days. Um, in the first four days, you still have uh, oxygen in there. And during that time, the silage heats up like crazy. And and sugars are burned through. And so that's one, one phase. During that phase, by the way, a lot of uh, nitrogen compounds are formed that are very dangerous, the so-called nitrogen gas. And that's uh, NO and NO2. Both of them are very toxic. If you inhale them, you fall over dead. Uh, they are very dangerous. They are a yellowish orange gas. So that's one aerobic phase. The other one is when you open the silage phase, when you open it to the atmosphere, you will immediately have oxygen uh, intruding into the phase of the silage. And that will lead to secondary um, fermentation. The phase will heat up and you can see it very well with infrared cameras. Uh, so additives can affect that to some extent, but I've never studied that. Uh, I have never studied that. I would probably uh, recommend other means of phase management to optimize secondary fermentation. I would not, if I were a dairyman today, I would not use one of those monster piles uh, and just deface, you know, half a foot or so a day. Instead, I would use an egg bag of these long sausage-like deals that have a much smaller surface area uh, and that generate much fresher material and offer much less surface to the uh, environment to volatilize off from. So uh, I believe that better than additives are proper storage forms for silages. Oh, but oh, all okay. that plastic, <laughs> all that plastic <laughs> in the egg bags, all that ancient carbon that you're drink using. <laughs> yeah, well, you can recycle it, you know, so it depends on what you do. I mean, you don't just want to have a plastic that you then throw away. That's very true. But there are companies that pick up that plastic and recycle it. And if you, if you go to dairies that used to have, and I do this a lot here in California, if you go to dairies that used to have 40,000 tons in one big pile, and that's how big these piles are, and uh, they report to you that they had 20% dry matter losses. And then they go from that to these long sausage-like things. And now they have 5% dry matter losses. Uh, then you really, you really pause and you say, wow, why did I wait so long? What was the matter with me? I understand it takes more area to dedicate to your feed storage. That I understand. But uh, you have a much better product to feed to your cows. And in my opinion, that to, in my opinion, to me, if I were a dairyman, that would be a no-brainer. I have a with regards to that. I have a comment from Nelson that says L. Buchneri inoculants can control yeast and secondary fermentation. Correct. Yes. Correct. Yeah, I have I have looked at that, at some of that too. There are quite a few. There are quite a few additives, uh, Buknerai and so on. Uh, I have tested about 10. Two of them worked well. The other eight didn't work well. Uh, so I've seen examples of additives that work well. The challenge is always how to 
homogeneously incorporate that into your silage and and that is not always an easy process you know when you have not much time uh, to waste uh, to build your piles and now you have to inoculate everything uh, in a homogeneous way that's not always an easy thing to do but uh, good custom harvesters they know how to do it well and um, they are up to the job Paula, did you still have more questions? Yes, of course. I have <laughs> one more. Okay. That I want to do. Okay. I want to ask you uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages in terms of sustainability of grazing systems? Hmm. So, um, First of all, sustainability, in my opinion, is not just environmental sustainability, okay? So uh, I, I cast that net much further than most. To me, sustainability includes environmental quality, which is air, water, and climate, but also animal welfare, food safety, workers, and financial viability. Five pillars, the five pillars of sustainability, if you ask me. So how does grazing affect those five pillars? Well, grazing will probably produce more methane simply because the amount of roughage in the diet is higher and roughage is what drives methane, enteric methane. But grazing land also has another impact and that is that when you deposit the manure into the soil, it's entrenched through hoof action into the soil then you are accelerating soil carbon sequestration. And soil carbon sequestration can be quite uh, dramatic in certain areas and not at all in others. And when I say dramatic, I mean uh, really drastically increase the rates of soil carbon being stored. Uh, it happens in some regions, it doesn't happen in others. And uh, it happens under some grazing management and not under others. And so the question is not, the topic is not really understood conclusively at this point. But what we do know is that soil carbon sequestration plateaus at some, at some point. And uh, depending upon where you are within that curve of, of plateau, of, of saturation is is the answer as to whether or not your locality is is good very good or extremely good in pulling carbon from the atmosphere and storing it in the ground so you have a trade-off between more methane from the cow through more enteric fermentation uh, of methane versus uh, sequestration which is a sink of carbon and so the math as to whether this system works well it has to be made individually per locality. And of course, mm -hmm. last not least, last not least, grazing animals are in general less efficient uh, with respect to production. And so that has to flow into the calculation as well. Okay, yes, a great answer. I, I have a, a question uh, regarding the silages. Mm -hmm. uh, Carlos wants to know if we can use acid to reduce the second phase, the second aerobic phase uh, in the in the phase of the silo. Yeah, it is it is being done. Acidification is one way of, of doing it. I haven't studied it, but it can be done. Uh, to me. The 800 pound gorilla when it comes to silage is two things. Not so much, not so much what kind of additives we use, whether we use a single cover or a double cover. Uh, I mean, those things might matter, but they influence single digits or so of dry matter losses. To me, what matters much more is the actual exposure of feed to air. And that exposure happens in two places. The one is at the face and the other one is at the feed bunk. Nutritionists are currently undervaluing the amount of dry matter losses that are occurring 
in the feed that we put in front of the cows. If we feed the cows once a day versus twice versus three times a day or four times a day, the, the percent dry metal loss is drastically different. If you don't believe me, measure it. Try it out. Try what it means to go one, two, three, four times a day feeding. And you'll be surprised with respect to how much dry matter loss you can manage by just changing that aspect. Everybody is thinking about the long-term storage and how we treat the silage itself. You should think about compacting it well at the beginning, getting it airtight. But all of that doesn't matter if you then have a gigantic phase from where you allow the stuff to volatilize off. Or if you just feed once a day and you have that stuff lying in the feed lane all day long. In that case, everything that's volatilizable will volatilize. And that's just the way it is. I've studied that in and out and I can assure you that to be true. Thank you very much, Frank. <laughs> yes, thank you. From from Nelson, he's just agreeing, saying, right, air exclusion is fundamental, compaction is key. So, uh, unless I get more questions or somebody wants to comment and say something, thank you, you know, maybe, so much. May, may, maybe, I say one more, maybe I say one more, yeah. one more thing because there was so, so much interest in silage. Uh, we have put um, oxygen sensors into the face of the silage piles. Because we wanted to know when you when you look at the face of the pile itself, how far into the face does oxygen penetrate? And we found that if you have an open face, it's going in up to eight feet. That's two meters. Mm -hmm. Two meters. The oxygen goes in two meters. And the warming of the face is profound. That means in this phase, we now have aerobic deterioration occurring, okay? So you do not want to produce perfect silage and then cause the stuff that you feed to your cows, which is the stuff you deface every day, to be of the poorest quality. You need that stuff to be of the best quality. And no, you do not want to have dry myelinosis that are very high at that phase. And so think about how you can minimize exposures, not just how you pack, not just how you cover, but think about how you minimize the exposure to oxygen. When you feed silage, oxygen is your enemy. It's that simple. Oxygen is your enemy. Hmm. <laughs> Tom. Awesome, Frank. Awesome, Frank. No, I just want to say thank you. And, and you know, you're going to dairy science, maybe we can try and find some good beer, but Kansas City and beer, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I have yeah, to tell are you, you travel? Really, are really, you going to dairy science? I will I will see if my calendar allows. I was planning to, but I also have some conflicts there. So I'm trying to resolve <laughs> conflicts, but I would like to. I want to tell if you not, one thing. I oh sorry, Tom, go ahead. I was gonna say, if not, plan on going to Euro tier and we'll have good German beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We go to Oktoberfest. <laughs> but but let me tell you this i do a lot of these webinars and so on but this year was one of the best i've ever done because so many great questions to uh, so many very relevant very relevant areas and and i appreciate being part of that so thank you and next week or next month you'll hear sarah place who did her phd in my lab and yes. so uh, yeah she is she's wonderful and so so is of course jude so have fun with that. Well, well, and if you have time to join us and I see you in the audience, I'll elevate you to panelists so you can join in the discussion. Oh, I don't want to impede any discussion there. So it might be too. <laughs> well, they were actually, they thought that would be quite neat. Uh, it's, it's great to have this sort of discussion. Thank you, everyone who asked questions. Thank you, Nelson, for the, the kudos. Really good discussion, Paula, as always, Sean, Marcos, I, I value you Thank you, you very so much. much. Yeah. Thank You're you, welcome. Frank. It's been fantastic. And hopefully I'll see you soon. Very well. All the best to you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, guys. Have a good night.
Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye -bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.